Chapter 2, Section 2. How does private property affect freedom? The right libertarian does not address or even acknowledge that the absolute right of private property may lead to extensive control by property owners over those who use but do not own property, such as workers and tenants. Thus, a free market capitalist system leads to a very selective and class-based protection of rights and freedoms. For example, under capitalism, the freedom of employers inevitably conflicts with the freedom of employees. When stockholders or their managers exercise their freedom of enterprise to decide how their company will operate, they violate their employees' right to decide how their laboring capacities will be utilized. In other words, under capitalism, the property rights of employers will conflict with and restrict the human rights of employees to manage themselves. Capitalism allows the right of self-management only to the few, not to all. Or alternatively, capitalism does not recognize certain rights as universal, which anarchism would. This can be seen from Austrian economist W. Duncan Rieke's defense of wage labor. While referring to intrafirm labor markets as hierarchies, Rieke, in his best ex cathedra tone, states that there's nothing authoritarian, dictatorial, or exploitative in the relationship. Employees order employers to pay them amounts specified in the hiring contract, just as much as employers order employees to abide by the terms of the contract. Markets, Entrepreneurs and Liberty, page 136, 137, if you want the citation. Given that the terms of contract involve the worker agreeing to obey the employer's orders and that they will be fired if they do not, it's pretty clear that the ordering that goes on in the intra-firm labor market is decidedly one way. Bosses have the power. Workers are paid to obey. And this then at least begs the question... If the employment contract creates a free worker, why must they abandon their liberty during work hours? Ricky actually recognizes that this lack of freedom in a roundabout way, he, he, uh, when he notes that, quote, employees in a firm at any level in the hierarchy can exercise an entrepreneurial role, the area within which that role can be carried out increases the more authority the employee has. See previous citation, page 142. Which means workers are subject to control from above, which restricts the activities they are allowed to do, and so they are not free to act make decisions, participate in the plans of the organization, create the future, and so forth within those working hours. And it is strange that while recognizing the firm as a hierarchy, Riki tries to deny that it's authoritarian or dictatorial, as if you could have a hierarchy without authoritarian structures or an unelected person in authority who isn't a dictator. His confusion is shared by Austrian guru Ludwig von Mises, Mises, actually, I believe is correct pronunciation on that, sorry, who asserts that the entrepreneur and capitalist are not irresponsible autocrats because they are unconditionally subject to the sovereignty of the consumer, while on the very next page, admitting that there is managerial hierarchy which contains the ab average subordinate employee. See Human Action, page 809 and 800, uh, page 810 for this citation. It does not enter his mind that the capitalist may be subject to some consumer control while being an autocrat to their su su uh, subordinated employees. Again, we find that the right libertarian acknowledging that the capitalist managerial structure is a hierarchy and workers are subordinated while denying it is autocratic to the workers. Thus, we have free workers within a relationship distinctly lacking freedom, in the sense of self-government at least. Seems to be a strange paradox. Indeed, if your personal life were as closely monitored and regulated as the work life of millions and billions of people across the world you would rightly consider it oppressive. Perhaps Riki, like most right libertarians, will maintain that worker voluntary agree, uh, that workers voluntarily agree or consent to be subject to the boss's dictatorship. He writes that, quote, each will only enter into the contractual agreement known as a firm if each believes that they will be better off thereby. 
The firm is simply another example of mutually beneficial exchange. See previous citation, page 137. However, this does not stop the relationship being authoritarian or dictatorial and so exploitative as it is highly unlikely that those at the top will not abuse their power. And as we argue further in the next section, in a capitalist society, workers have the option of finding a job or facing abject poverty and or starvation and or homelessness and or disease and death due to a capitalist for-profit healthcare system. Little wonder then that people voluntarily sell their labor and consent to these authoritarian structures. They have little option to do otherwise. So within the labor markets, workers can and do seek out the best working conditions possible, but that does not mean that the final contract agreed is freely accepted and not due to the force of circumstances, that both parties have equal bargaining power when drawing up the contract or that the freedom of both parties is ensured. Which means to argue, as many right libertarians do, that freedom cannot be restricted by wage labor because people enter into relationships they consider will lead to improvements over their initial situation totally misses the point. As the initial situation is not considered relevant, their argument fails. After all, agreeing to work in a sweatshop 14 hours a day is an improvement over starving to death, but it, doesn't, it does not mean that those who uh, so agree are free when working there or actually want to be there. They are not, and it's the circumstances created and enforced by the law that have ensured that they consent to such a, reg uh, uh, a regimen. Given the chance, they would desire to change that regime, but cannot, as this would violate their boss's property rights and they would be repressed for trying. So the right-wing libertarian right is interested only in a narrow concept of freedom rather than in freedom or liberty as such. This can be seen in an argument of Ayn Rand, <clears throat> a so-called leading ideologue of libertarian capitalism or objectivism, that freedom in a political context means freedom from government coercion. It does not mean freedom from the landlord or freedom from the employer or freedom from the laws of nature which do not provide men with automatic prosperity. It means freedom from the coercive power of the state and nothing else. Capitalism, the unknown ideal, page 192. By arguing in this way, right libertarians ignore the vast number of authoritarian social relationships that exist in capitalist society and, as Rand does, imply that these social relationships are like the laws of nature. However, if one looks at the world without prejudice but with an eye to maximizing freedom, the major coercive institution is seen not to, uh, to be not the state but capitalist social relationships at present. The right libertarian, then, far from being a defender of freedom, is in fact a keen defender of certain forms of authority and domination. As Kropotkin noted, quote, The modern individualism initiated by Herbert Spencer is like the critical theory of Proudhon, a powerful indictment against the dangers and wrongs of government, but its practical solution of the social problem is miserable, so miserable as to lead us to inquire if the talk of no force be merely an excuse for supporting landlord and capitalist domination. Act for yourselves, page 98. To defend the freedom of property owners is to defend authority and privilege. In other words, statism. So, in considering the concept of liberty as freedom from, it's clear that by defending private property as opposed to possession, the so-called anarcho-capitalist is defending the power and authority of property owners to govern those who use their property. And also, we must note, defending all the petty tyrannies that make the work lives of so many people frustrating, stressful, and unrewarding. However, Anarchism, by definition, is in favor of organizations and social relationships which are non-hierarchical, heterarchical, and non-authoritarian. Otherwise, some people are more free than others. Failing to attack these hierarchies leads to massive contradiction. For example, since a British army is a volunteer one, it's an anarchist organization. What? In other words, full capitalist property rights do not protect freedom. In fact, they actively deny it. But this lack of freedom is only inevitable if we accept capitalist private property rights. If we reject them, we can try and create a world based on freedom in all aspects of life rather than just a 